Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, welcome to this talk with uh, Graham Thompson from Optimo Hats uh, from Chicago. My name is Simon Crompton, uh, if anyone doesn't know me, from the website Permanent Style. And tonight we're going to have a brief chat about uh, hats in general, a little bit about Optimo, trying to kind of explain a bit of the background on, I guess, quality hats, styles of hats, and maybe a little bit at the end about styles of hats and why most people think that hats don't suit them, and we'll try and fix that. So Graham, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Let's kind of kick off talking about quality. What, what makes a quality hat, like a felt hat to start with, what makes a, kind of a quality hat one better than another? That's a long question. Yeah, okay. It's a lot of details, mm -hmm. and this is what I've been after for my career, going on 25 years. And I've always loved hats. One of the things that I found when I was a kid, and I found the first hats that felt really, really good, mm. they were made decades earlier. And what, so, how do they feel good? What was it about them that kind of felt like quality? It was, there was a softness, but also a denseness to them. The okay. way that they would react to how you pinch them, how you shape them. And it was something that you know, to me seemed quite intuitive. Yeah. I could, I could tell right away. And um, I mean, a brief aside, when I started my business, we began primarily as a um, service business. Mm. So we weren't making a lot of hats. We were servicing and renovating, cleaning and blocking hats, which is a, that goes way back. I mean, that's, that service has almost disappeared. But back, you know, in the 1950s and before, mm. there were, every town had a hatter that would primarily like service and clean and block and renovate hats. Yeah. So hats were built to be serviced. So and you when, needed that robustness and that strength in order to be able to be used and serviced again and again for years. Yeah, in a way, this, is, this was the expectation. So there was an understanding and a culture of, of wearing hats and a culture and an expectation in the industry of a certain type of quality. So mm. I was able to see, the, uh, and, and it was trying to figure out this question, what makes a great hat? What makes a real good quality hat? And I could start to notice in a very short time where I could literally see them from the street walking in. It's like, whoa, that one's a good one. And it was, it was the, the way that the felt would glow, the way that the brim would break. Um, and then when we started to make our own hats more and, and continuously make them more refined and strong yeah. through just a series of, of processes, which I'd love to get into, um, but it's a lot of technical stuff. And what's What's really great being here on Savile Row and, and talking to a lot of the other makers and tailors is, is the same principles of quality that mm. go into making so many things, so many things that you, that you yeah, read about. Well, it's a good point. I think it's interesting that combination of, of kind of softness and a nice feel, but also strength is common to a lot of things, I think. Yeah. Um, the, if we could try and break down the kind of quality points, so that kind of a, the softness and the, but still the strength. How is that affecting the raw materials, for example? What are the different raw materials you could use for a hat? And are they, when you go from, for example, a fur and then up to a hair and a, and a beaver, do they always get stronger and always get that kind of softness as well with different materials? Well, I'll start at felt. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll try not to get off on a tangent so uh, <laughs> I can get lost in some of this stuff. Felt is basically, it, it's um, some sort of, of fur. I mean, synthetics can be used, but we're not really talking about that. Um, most of the hats that are made today, I think, for, for dress hats that you see are made out of wool. Okay. So if you take sheared wool and you, you grab some, some sheared wool and you, you pack it together and you pound it and get it wet, it will felt. It, yeah. it, it will bind together for, through a, a process which is, you know, furs twisting in on themselves, but it's something that you can almost do, like crafters can do it at yeah. home with a mallet and stuff like that. And everyone knows felt them. material that you'd use at home for craft and other things as well, right? You exactly. know what that material is like. Exactly. So, mm. you know, the wool, and, and, and when, then when that piece goes, you, you can just pull it apart. Yeah. It's not, it's not a, a very, uh, for hats, w was always considered the lowest grade. Now there's variation within that, sure. of course, but then you get into, uh, finer micron uh, furs like rabbit is probably, when you see, see a hat that's marked full, fur felt hat, it would yep. be rabbit. Okay. Uh, generally, it's, so it's that's a, And then 
shaving the rabbit or how are yeah. we can that okay so it's so it's uh these are pelts and like most of the rabbit for for instance comes from it's from butchers it's left over it's, okay. it's a carcass that it, um will just it will then be taken it goes through a cleaning process yeah. and then it's sheared so it comes off of the hide and okay. it's, it's, it's sheared it's sheared sheared fur well if you take rabbit f um, fur and you you do the same thing you compact it yeah it's going to be tighter. It'll feel tighter, mm. and it and it it, it felt tighter. Then when you get into the wild furs and beaver, being what we specialize in, yeah, it's it it's just even with a small test, you can see that it binds. It's so much stronger. It's much stronger. So this was discovered years and years ago, and it's an incredibly tight uh, felt. And there's a lot of different furs that that do that, but how it's made and how that felt is milled makes a huge difference okay. because hats that were made you know in the 1930s and 40s that you know maybe were not made with beaver they were made with rabbit they could be still beautiful. be very very good quality yes. okay exactly. so you see so you've got wool and then rabbit and beaver pretty much roughly but then yeah. within those there's a huge difference depending on who's just making the hat bodies themselves right is that yeah it's, that, it's when you say um, mill you mean the people actually making the bodies that the you raw the, material yeah which you buy then make into a hat right yeah exactly so okay. we i mean we do manufacture our own hats but we don't you know the, the process of making this hood is yeah. is another a huge operation and yeah. all of these steps to do that also are very very critical that it's you know it, it starts with the raw material and how it's processed and how it's clean and how it's formed and you know how it's dyed and even how it's how long it's been aged i mean there's all of these intricacies that you can dig deeper and deeper into sure. yeah and then and then how it is then finished and so when we get those hats they go through blocking processes and shaving and you know you, 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 when you get the material it's uh it's it's rough yeah and it's that's where so much of the hatter's art goes in um is 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 getting a beautiful finish on this piece of uh, yeah. of material and so in uh those so we're just talking about the, the beaver for example at the very top end then it seems to me having seen the process at the factory i mean most of those processes are about making that material denser and stronger basically aren't they making that bind even stronger and making things denser is that fairly accurate or is it yeah i mean a lot of the processes that uh that are done they they do um they make the shape more permanent okay and the more that you uh work this felt and compact it and, and put it through these processes it ideally should get softer more more elegant more malleable okay uh, but not lose strength okay so that's the uh the thing that you're you know so from the start to finish you want to keep the integrity of the build yeah of that all the way through mm -hmm. i'm trying to keep it not too not, <laughs> uh, not no but i think it's interesting because you could go into all the different processes that you go through on hat you know on every single hat and there's a lot of those and that probably be too technical but i find it interesting that most of them are aiming for that same kind of thing as you said they're making them softer but they're still retaining that strength or if anything adding slightly more strength to them and i find a lot of people who have maybe bought a cheap hat say a wool hat from somewhere else or even a rabbit hat somewhere else or even have bought maybe a beaver hat from somewhere else and bought one of your hats the thing that they notice is that kind of strength and malleability kind of combination certainly i did yeah. when I it. and i just because i think there are very very few people certainly very very few factories in the world make it to that level now correct yeah absolutely and it's it, for me, I think it's intuitive. I see it with a lot of customers. You, you, you know, can show this uh, the difference. Yeah. And um, not everybody is going to see or feel that. But like, I always feel that that the that the real the true hat make uh, hat uh, wearers, right? Yeah. When they put it on, you, you can just there's something intuitive, and you can start to feel that quality. Yeah. But we've also. Um, since we started, our, our market niche has been very, very narrow, and our hats are very expensive. It's expensive to make uh, pieces like this, and you have to focus, and we've built an entire factory dedicated just to this category of hat. Yeah. So, you know, I think that that's, it's really something that, that needs to be focused on, and that's, mm. that's our entire that's our entire niche. And then, I know you spent a long time over the last few years trying to get some of that old machinery from around the world, collecting it from French barns or anywhere else yeah. and trying to kind of put it all in one place. Is it, are there still stages of that process that you haven't been able to do that 
or machines that you just you really want to find you haven't been able to get so far? Still things to aim for? Um, there's always something, but when we moved into our new facility, that pretty much had we've gotten most of the main components. So yeah, it's okay. been a 25 year treasure hunt of all of not only the lost knowledge and expertise on how to do this, mm. but all of the tools, machinery. Yeah, yeah. When we chatted about that, I, you told me that you've you know you've heard this kind of story in all different types of, of luxury goods and well-made yeah. things. And this is exactly the same, you know, we, there's certain principles that, um, there's certain things, of course, that are just, just for the hats, but the, the principles seem to be the same. Digging yeah. into, you know, understanding the material and understanding every component of every process that you do. Yeah. And then just putting these all together. So we're never taking steps out. We're always adding more processes and steps and refinement and strength and, and just mm. trying to, you know, do this. The, the thing mainly I'm working on now that I'm very excited is new finishes. Okay. Uh, you know, satins and long hair. And this is... So making the surface of the hat look different. fluffier, sleeker, smoother, harder yeah. kind of thing. Okay. Exactly. And you, and you need particular machinery to do that kind of things? You can't do that by hand? Well, you can do all of these processes. Um, well, I have to think about that for a second. Most of the process is by hand. I mean, mm. you, you can, and most of the, the tools were always, you know, adapted to try to, you know, improve these these processes. But always on the hunt for that kind of stuff. Okay. And uh, and most of this, so, you know, we I do a lot of testing too, you know, scratching fur up and stuff like that to see how it would lay. And then it's like, you know, okay, it's ready for... Um, it's like being in the laboratory, which I, which I really love. It's a temptation then to just to make... I don't know, fluffy and fluffier hats or something. I feel like kind of like they're already pretty smooth. The only way they can go is just to get kind of more texture or longer hair or something. As well, you said. We, we've done, you know, for example, this is this is one that uh, a gentleman actually who stopped by today, you know, spotted. Right, this is a, a, a melazine or long hair uh, finish. We've made these for for years, okay. and we make a very nice one. And but this is made with different fur. Beaver okay. is extremely uh, tightly felting, so you okay. can't really pull the the fur out this, huh. this long. And, so you have and, to use rabbit then? Or do you uh, this, use... is, this is made with Harris fur. Okay. And the, it's just an, all of these finishes, it's a combination of what are you starting with? Yeah. And what, what's the end result? And it's, it's different than other textiles. It's certainly different than wood, for example. You know, we hmm. essentially sand these on these different machines. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's sort of like a sanding process. But it's not like you don't treat it the same way, you know, where you just keep making it finer and finer yeah. and finer and softer. You've got a certain layer that you can't get beyond. Beneath, you've got okay. uh, so many different. Uh, but this is what the challenge is, is to sort of do this and come up with finishes that haven't been made to the quality that they were years ago okay. for, for, for many years. And then, you know, in it, we also discovering new stuff and hmm. innovating. As how, because most of the kind of, uh, high-end high hat makers that I know, bespoke ones, are one-man operations, you know, guy in the attic kind of making everything himself. How is he doing some of these processes which you're doing with machinery? Because you've made things by hand as well, historically, right, these hats. So how do those kind of processes combine? Does it just take longer and it's less consistent when you're having to do everything by hand? Or what is it, does the machinery add something which you just can't get by hand? Or I learned to make uh, hats with just uh, hand tools. Mm -hmm. And I had a mentor who uh, taught me the principles of making great hats and taking care to do those steps. You can make a hat that is solid. You can make a hat that is completely fine and achieve the objective that you want to do. And it has the look that you want. And there's mm -hmm. so many offshoots, you know, is it more towards fashion? Is sure. it more yeah, towards... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you're not going to get the refinement, and there's certain processes where you need a certain amount of speed or, or whatever. And so what do you mean by refinement? What kind of particular things is it hard to do? Well, I mean, for example, you know, this, kind this of hat. Uh, I mean, without tools, you put it on a, on a wheel, and, and you can, um, like we used to take those and put hot oil on them. Yeah. And that was just the old, that was a way that I was taught, and, you know, people would come in after having their hat. Um, we, we'd clean it and block it and put uh, hot oil or if we'd make one it was it would look nice and, and shiny but it was different it was so it didn't reach the level of the stuff that i had seen okay. from the 1920s and 30s in a certain area that had specialized in that and 
you can just see the difference. So there's certain things that you just, it's a matter of having the proper tools mm -hmm. for certain types of, of work. And so things like putting those, that, like the hot oil, for example, is that almost like creating a, a layer that was then going to come off or rub off or crack or something in the long term? A little bit. It's, yeah. it's essentially, I mean, it's, um, it gets into the, the faux area or yeah. something. You know, it's, okay. it's not, it's a, an imitation of what the really, really great way to do it yeah. is. Which is maybe fine if it's kind of a... I know it's an occasion hat. It's a hat you wear to Ascot once a year or whatever it might be, right? Yeah. Then maybe that's okay. But if it's something you're actually going to use as a practical piece of clothing every day, it's not really going to wear in the same way, right? Yeah. And that's what I think I find really appealing about the, that point about robustness that we talked about is the fact that that greater quality means that it's something which like you were saying like a car can run over and you can smash it and you can still theoretically reblock it and remake it. Whereas if a cheap hat, it's just going to destroy it. You're not going to be able to do anything with it because yeah, it's going to rip the felt. So. Absolutely. And, and that's in, a, in something that's got, you know, that's a heavier weight hat, but yeah. also in a light, thin hat, mm -hmm. you don't want to sacrifice um, strength because, you know, then the, the hat, there's a point where it can be elegant and thin and, you know, it has some character to, to the lines. Yeah. But then there's a, when it's when it's all when it's a mess or floppy, you can just kind of tell. Again, this is something that when you're shown it, you can kind of tell. You can see the difference between that. Mm -hmm. And so even on a thin, all the way up to the robust strength of production and work, I th it, it, in in each process is, I think, really critical to a well-made hat. And that's mm -hmm. what my mentor taught me from the beginning. It's like it was all about make these with integrity. And uh, I mean, like a piece of outerwear, like a raincoat, or like something else, it does a job and it's got to carry on doing that job every yeah. single day. This is utilitarian luxury, not fashion, utilitarian luxury. And, you know, another point, you know, I, when you mention like more of a uh, one person operation, uh, and again, this is how I learned. My mentor, he had it for 50 years. Hmm. And when he was doing, uh, you were able to get great hats from a number of manufacturers all over the world. And you primarily went to a hatter to get something different, something that was not being made or they couldn't get. Okay, yeah, more a like a bespoke drop. suit almost, and you want a bit more creativity and personality too. Absolutely, well. yeah. so that's a lot of times what's on, what's on offer. And you, know, you were able to take a hat that would be um, beautiful quality, but it wasn't the, 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 the style that you wanted. And yeah. So we, you know, what he did for years too is a lot of like cut down a brim, okay. restyle it, make the, you know, and, and good felt is also very malleable. You can change it. So if you, you know, someone wants a deeper brim curve in there, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, can, that can happen. But again, <laughs> the better the quality of the material itself and the yeah. build of it, the more adaptable it is and the more of that stuff that you can do. That's interesting because I think it's often, I think people often have a struggle with this with shirts, for example, and some other kind of suiting materials as well. There's an assumption that things that are, uh, maybe with socks as well, that are kind of better and you're paying more for will also be more robust. But a lot of the time in luxury clothing, it's the opposite. Like you get a very, very fine sock, you get a very, very fine shirt material. Actually, it's harder to look after. It doesn't last as well because it's to this kind of luxury thing that actually you can't treat that hard. Whereas yeah. it's nice that that's really appealing and a hat that you can do that. Yeah, no, it's, and that's, um it's something that, that always bothers me. If I you know, pay a lot of money for something yeah. and it's uh, quote luxury, well, I, you know, I don't want it to be falling apart, you know, and, and pilling or it's like, oh, you can't, you know, you can't touch it. Is, there, is it too much it, to say that's a Chicago thing in a way like practicality, utility? It, it, I mean, it could be. I, I think that, you know, I, I love well-made things mm. and, and talking to makers of well-made things and the, the quest to find well-made things as well as to understand when something's well-made and how it's done. Mm. Um, that's just something I've always loved. Mm. And it, the, the stuff that I want is always going to be, you know, in, in that uh, in that area, of the in that area, or, yeah. or it's not. But how about apart. straws? Presumably, if you get a very the finer, more expensive a straw gets, it doesn't get stronger. Presumably, does it get more delicate or not? It's um, you've got more in general. You've got more like this is a fine, a fine um, weave, not the finest. This one I can grab the finest one. I brought this, these different hat bodies to show clients that you know all oh, the different, different weaves, the different weaves okay. and categories, and you can get up to a very very fine hat like this. Um, this one took 
months for a single weaver to weave. Mm. Um, you've got more, it's so much finer, so there's more points for this to bend. Okay. And in that regard, it's, it's stronger. Mm. But the main thing that, that we found, the main damage with, with our Panama hats is when they're grabbed up in the crown. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Because you're pitching it, like a, you're folding it too yes. sharply, basically. When, uh, if, ah. if somebody comes up and pinches it, you know, we're always like, you know, as we hand these over to clients, <laughs> we're always saying, you know, handle by the brim. Yeah. Other than that, these can last for years and years, be serviced, uh, reformed. But when you crack the, when the straw cracks, then that's there's not much you can do about that. No, point, right? no. I mean, it, it, at that point, I mean, some people like it. It's like a ripped pair of jeans or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you okay. can, you know, turn them around. But um, they they tend to be stronger technically when they're finer, finer. Okay. In, in that. But then they get to a point where they're so fine that yeah. you can, like, you, easily. You, you, you can give them a yank and they could actually oh, okay. tear. So it's, uh, there's a point where it stops. And, and how about, how about uh, rollable ones, both on Panamas and felt? Because that was always the legend with the, with the Panamas particularly, wasn't it? That you could kind of roll them up or kind of... Yeah. Fit well, with. this is uh, an annoyance of mine is the, what I would call the tourist Panama. Okay. Um, that... I don't know when this came to be, but they they started the the real true roll up hat. It's a very fine Monte Cristi like this yeah. that that can be folded and rolled. Now this hat has not been blocked. I mean this is, but uh, it's not going to hurt the hat to to roll it up like this. But it's not going to get like a pinch point right at the very top or something where it might crack or something. Well, this is how the the style called the Optimo that we named the company after kind yeah. of comes down the center. Ah, you, see you have a crease pre put in there to make that easier. Yeah. Okay. And, and so we actually make that model, but to make it and it's not going to crack, it should be a finer one. Okay. But then when they're finer, they're very expensive. Yeah. But it makes a very, very elegant hat. And the same thing with a really, really well-made one. You can pack it and it will come back, but it's not going to have a perfect shape. Mm -hmm. um, we're starting to do more roll up felts. Now these... Yeah, so what do you have to do to a felt to make it rollable then? Well, what we do is we take the, on the inside, most of our, like these two felts right here, mm -hmm. it's the same material. If you feel those two, this is going to feel a lot lighter. Yeah. For the uh, almost like different, uh, it's, it's basically that this one is finished with a sweatband. Yes, this feels a lot a softer, lining. but it's just, I, I wouldn't think it was the same felt. It's the same felt. So okay. there's, a, there's a few things that, that you're feeling. One is this has a welt edge, so it's folded over and stitched. So it's okay. a double thick edge. Yeah. And this is just a raw edge. It doesn't have that. So you've got a thinner feeling there. And then we put a cloth band instead of a thick leather sweatband, mainly so it can, and no lining, yeah. mainly so that it doesn't bunch up. Um, when you roll it, that's not going to all kind of crinkle together. Right? Yeah. Okay. Unless you want to beat your hat up. I mean, I have a few of my hats I've just taken and rolled it up, you know, and it, just to test it, even with the sweatband and everything. Yeah. And, and it's, it's the same material, so it can do that. But you can see with this, here's one that can actually be rolled. We make this model just for travel only. Mm -hmm. And um, it can be rolled up for weeks, months, uh, years, and it should pretty much write itself like this. Mm. And you know, like, this is a good example where, you know, you, th these don't look nice if they're not made out of strong material to mm. me. You know, mm. the, the, it's, it's too floppy. Um, but this will come back in shape and, and have a really nice, and it also allows you, good felt allows you to just kind to of... To shape it quite easily. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the yeah, things I noticed, and I, I know other people said, when um, Carney featured in our pop-up um, a few months ago, it was... Interesting, as soon as people who wore hats started doing that kind of playing with the hat, started shaping it themselves, and particularly when you showed them how to do it, that's another one of the ways you felt the difference in the quality of the felt, I think, the way you can shape it. Because yeah. even on the cheaper hats, even though you can shape it, it's got a shape baked in there, which you're really not changing that much. Whereas this feels like it could be absolutely anything, depending on what, how you fold it or what you do with it, right? Yeah, it can go different ways. And this is what our hats are known for, is it's, you, can, you can put a break in it, whatever way and it, it it will stay there very nicely and it also it when they're like this they absorb the personality of the wearer their lifestyle you can kind of just see it and so you know this whole conversation is something that um i mean to me it's like 
I, I love sharing this, especially you know with, with new clients, people that that are interested in hats. They they're drawn to this somehow, and. It's almost like a, I feel like I was passed a, a torch, you know, on the understanding of this this thing. And and I share like a lot of times I'll, I'll run into an old timer and they'll they'll understand, they'll see it, or they 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 kind so of. So how know. does it, how does it gain personality apart from how you I and mean, how you shape it and pick it up every day? So this is my hat, and I would tend to pick yeah. it up by that every day. I'm shaping every time I pick it up and put it on like that, right? Yep. But how else is it gaining my personality? What else do you mean? You mean it's just gonna get dirty in particular places or? It can. It's going to get, get mean, a bit of my baby sick on it, or what's it going to yeah, like? Um, it's, you're already doing that. The way that you're handling the hat, I mean, it's starting to, you know, if, if you want it to be absolutely pristine, then, you know, just handle by the brim and don't touch the crown. But that's what I do with my hats, too, you know, and that's suddenly you're not even aware of it, but it starts to take a different form and shape. Okay. If you wear it in the rain a lot, it's going to, you know, sometimes bake the shape in a little bit more. That's another thing. These are fine to wear in the rain, in the, the snow. Yeah. You know, and um, it's. That's uh, actually one of the, I find them, I mean, even other hats I've had, them, one of the most practical and satisfying things is wearing it in the rain because it's so practical. You're completely sheltered, basically, from most things that are going on. And if it's a good hat, then it recovers perfectly afterwards. You've got other people kind of dashing around trying to hold hat, like books over their heads or whatever else. Oh yeah, I was, uh, someone asked me the other day about plastic hat covers and you know, I don't know if you've ever <laughs> seen that, but you know, imagine wearing a hat and then putting like a plastic, like a shower cap over top of it. You know, it well, that's like putting a plastic coating over your raincoat, like your, your raincoat yeah, should be do the job, be, right? Like, exactly. <laughs> so a lot of it is pretty common sense, you know, but the, the hat industry collapsed decades ago, basically. And, mm. and a lot of this was lost and, and what came out of it in general, uh, kind of costume pieces came out, and the mm. quality just kept pulling out of it, and, and that's you know a, a knowledge really that was. Well, people aren't, the problem is, I guess, is that people aren't wearing them enough because they're not wearing them enough. They don't value them in quite the same way, and therefore they're not prepared to pay for the quality or don't have the understanding of what makes the quality, and therefore for the industry it just becomes less and less worth it putting the quality in, right? Exactly. All it was just a, a downward spiral mm. that I think you know started in the in the 1950s primarily. It, it, it started. Going well, and I mean, we're, um, we're going to get some questions from our lovely guests yeah. in a moment. Um, but before we do that, the, the question of style, why do, why do most guys think that hats don't suit them? Well, um, I don't know if most guys think that it doesn't no? uh, suit them or women. I'm not sure what that, um, that's an interesting question. I just like that certainly a lot of guys think that they, they've, they've gone into a hat shop, they've put a hat on, they go, no, I don't look good in hats and they walk out, and they've done that once or twice, and after that they just think, nah, it doesn't work. And yet, you look at every historical photo, and you've got hundreds of people standing there in hats, all look pretty good in their hats. And, and I don't know, what, I, I've always felt that it's because they don't have the understanding or sort of the patients, or maybe the customer service in the shop to get an understanding of actually what suits them. And therefore they just think they're gonna put on a hat like they put on a beanie or a cap or something and think yeah. that's it, but actually, you know, if the brim is like a quarter inch smaller, it'd make a massive difference, you know, or the crown is, is you know, half an inch lower, huge. it's a huge difference. Yeah, I mean, part of it is, um, the, the main thing, if you don't want to wear hats, they're not gonna look good on you, right? Like okay. with anything, so who, who really looks good in, in hats are people that appreciate them have an affinity for them and want to wear them. You know, they've even even historical. When you look at the the great old films and certain people that like really look good and had, they were always people that loved and appreciated. Clearly hats. enjoying what they were doing. In yeah, it's, and it's the same. Th it's not just hats, right? It's the same thing with all these different categories of clothing. But then there's also things to take into consideration that might seem basic, but not everybody knows. I mean, mm. it has to fit. It shouldn't be sitting high on your head. It should be comfortable. Mm. Uh, the crown should should have a proportion to your face. The mm. brim should have a proportion to your body. The, and then the way that you style it, just so you, you have, you, have you got your hat here actually, or or an A hat? Uh, I'm interested because you wear your. I I tend to wear tend to wear mine in sort of quite low on my head yeah. and feel and quite straight. But I've always wanted or found it interesting guys like you who wear it actually much higher on their head and kind of further back on their head. Well, there's, if thing. you could so, hand it to me, it's right this one? there. That's, that's mine. So this is, this is one that uh, I made a few years ago. I brought two hats with me on this trip. And it's, uh, I, I, don't, I don't really even think about it. I just put it- Because you've been doing it for years and years. You don't have to think about it anymore, right? But that's, yeah. that's sitting significantly further back on your head than I would normally wear it and also more tilted, right? 
I, I think so. And it's just personal preference. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. like when, when clients will come in and I'll be working with them, we'll, we'll place it a certain way mm -hmm. or tilt it a certain way. And, or maybe we'll, maybe we'll snap it a certain way. And especially the more that a client is knowing what they want, they won't even understand, but they'll just kind of naturally just stop you know, playing with like, it. Like, let's say we put it on like this, you yeah. know, it, you can just, they'll, yeah. It's hard for me to explain, but no, but it, but, but I, I, I think I agree. It is hard. To, it's hard to explain, and I find it really interesting that I think it needs that kind of customer service in the shop because guys don't know how to do that. I have no confidence yeah. in doing that, and guys are such wimps that if you know they wear a hat and they go out someday and they're wearing a hat and some guy guys some guy looks at them strangely or says like that's oh, an odd hat or something or they'll put yeah. it down and never wear it again. Like yeah. so, they need to have full confidence and that hat looks good, that this is a good hat, that this is the hat that fits me and suits me, and then they're kind of wearing it, and then over time they'll kind of come to love it. Absolutely, and you usually, you know, when it's right, and it has to fit your, I mean, one thing is it can fit your build, mm -hmm. but also it has to fit your style. Mm -hmm. So some people are, you know, will event, immediately say like, well, if you haven't had one of our hats or you're not a hat wearer, we'll tend to go for something pretty conservative, and it, but that may not fit your style. And mm -hmm. so that's also, I think even overrides the proportionality when mm. someone is wearing some of the coolest hats ever worn by anybody. Some of the most iconic hats, they didn't particularly fit the person perfectly. It okay. fit their style. So you can you can break the oh. rules and you so can- So they're wearing hats which were a little bit too, too big, big, theoretically, for example? Yeah, yeah. okay. Too big. I mean, no one has this, I mean, no one has the proportion for a 10 gallon hat, right? Theoretically. like. Something we could be, a lot of those hats were so big, they know it's not about the proportion Absol anymore. The, 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 this is about the way they wear them, right? those Western hats. The Western hats are a great example. Yeah. I mean, I've, this is my whole life, hats, right? And I love the old, especially the, the old school Western hats. But yeah. putting on a hat, like, <laughs> like I, I, I couldn't pull it off, no way. <laughs> as well as some of my favorite colors and all that. It's like, it has to suit you and your personality and everything like that, as well yeah. as certain, uh, styles that are very, uh, you know, we I showed you the bowler earlier, you know, like that. It's it, to me that would be, be a little bit like a bow tie. Like who who looks good a bow tie? Well, okay, somebody that wants to wear that. It's part of their style. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, yeah, hard to force that. You know, so it can't be like I know it's good for you. It's this. So we, you know, I like to work with the people to find that out. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much. And that's all the sure. questions I had. Great okay. chat. Um, does anybody have any questions for Graham? Yes, Kurt. So I have a comment, and this wasn't mentioned, but one of the great hallmarks of an Optimo hat, I, I have lots of Optimo hats, I have lots of hats in general, is, and I use the word resilient. You can take them, squash them off, and they come yeah. back. I, I mean, I had that situation just traveling from California where I had another one that I wanted to bring. And so basically, I just, packed it down, rolled it up, and shoved it in my bag. And it, I knew that it would spring back. And that word resilient, I think, is what Optimo and Graham does that I don't see anywhere else. And when it comes back, it comes back exactly as it was. There are no buckle wrinkles around, around the edges. Hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, and that, is, that was not a roll-up model, just as no, one of your regular hats, yeah. No. And that was not a place question, by the way, as it's well. No, it's not, no, no, it's I've, not a... uh, I, I've, done that, I've done that too. Sometimes, you know, you, it's, you don't want to carry it with you. It's too hot. You, you don't have, a, you know, or you've, if, uh, and you can just take them and smash them in a, in a bag. And, you know, it, it can wrinkle or damage the hat a little bit. Um, but you can always bring it back as we well, right? If that happened, then you can just send it back for service. For service. Yeah. But generally, if you know just how to feather them out, they, they right themselves. Mm. I mean, that's the same across elements. Snow, rain, whatever. They're resilient. They, they, mm. they come back. They don't look battered or beat. And I've not seen that with... Other... And I find it hard, it's a hard thing often with travel, like if you're going from, going from here to Italy and it might be absolutely pissing it down in London and, you, and you're wearing a hat when you get to Italy and it's kind of, you know, 15 degrees warmer and, and bright sunshine, like, you might want to actually, on the way home, you're going to want to put the hat somewhere, you don't look a bit silly going to the airport wearing it, so you need to have some way to kind of store it and carry it that way. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, yeah, could the, um, the fact that the practical aspect of wearing a hat is unappreciated be at the root of one of these problems? Uh, in terms of people persisting with that, I mean, sunglasses, you have people who try a pair of sunglasses, don't feel sunglasses suit them, but they persist 
Whereas, but, and they think you think they persist because it's practical. Because it's practical, and when mm. they're actually the fact that the, the practical aspects of the hat is, is something which is underappreciated can mm. be why people don't value quality because of the rain and. All these well, it's interesting, isn't it? That? Actually, think of sunglasses. Like sunglass, everyone thinks that sunglasses look cool. Like universally, I'm, I'm sure that's as much of a reason as well. I mean, guys wear sunglasses on the tube or whatever, but they're not wearing because it it's bright. They're wearing it because it's cool. So maybe it's just like if we just get, I don't, I completely agree. Practicality is probably core, cool, but if hats could get very, very cool again, that would probably help, I reckon. <laughs> Do you think? They are. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Are. sorry. Um, they are cool. Sorry. It's, um, <laughs> well, it, it, I mean, it's, it, it has to look right, you know, and, and it's, it is definitely, I think that uh, the utility is not understood. Um, not every hat has that kind of utility, but you can, it's very easy. I mean, there's people that have never worn hats in their, you know, they get into them in their 70s, 80s even, and all of a sudden it's discovered, wow, this is a really, you know, I mean, with weather like this, I can see where my hats are popular in London, you know, our different markets that we hit, you know, San Francisco's a good market, mm -hmm. uh, Chicago, of course, and, you know, it is, you know, if it's a walking city, and especially if you get that cold rain, you need it. And once you're, you're used to it, you feel it. But it's been forgotten mm. and lost. And um, I have a question actually for the audience that I think is a fun one. When does everybody think that hats began to decline in popularity? Which point in history did they start to become unpopular? A year. <laughs> Any guesses? Like, um, was it around the Second World War? The the First World War? The Second World War? No. It's, what's your guess? Was it around then? Is that when? Yeah, the I mean, seventies maybe. The, the, I, I, I was yeah. always told it was it was Kennedy in the sixties. Kennedy, Kennedy he famously didn't wear a hat for his inauguration. Yeah, and like it became made hats not cool. That's or, a funny one that I'll get. Like, I mean, every time I'm in the. The, the shop like once yeah. a week do you know who killed the hat <laughs> and it's 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 an old wise tale so like um, the 60s 70s i mean these all had periods of decline but in the u.s and i think it would be similar worldwide hats began to decline in 1913. Uh, the industry was huge so per capita though it was i mean so many people were, were into it and the, the industry saw it coming and it kept going so when they were making the the very best hats, which I, from the ones I've seen, tended to be from the 1930s, 40s, where they were, um, had made greater and greater strides in quality. And the industry was still huge, but it was, uh, with the rise of the automobile, um, you, you didn't need it as much. And so today, you know, you don't really, if you're in your car all the time and you're, then you don't really need a hat. But if you're walking more, so it tends to be more of an urban thing. Mm -hmm. And then with the understanding of um, you know, other practical stuff like skin cancer and, you know, a lot of people are needing a hat that way. And then mm -hmm. they come into it and say, wow, this also looks great. It's part of my, my style and personality. But it started to decline that long ago. Well, it hit rock bottom when I got into it in the 90s. And it's, Good timing. It's coming back together. And it's also definitely associated with classic style and mm. all of this other, you know, fabulous stuff that's um, represented so in such an amazing way here on Savile Row. Mm. It, it goes with all this stuff. It's very classic. It's not old fashioned. It's classic. Mm -hmm. It's mm. timeless. It's... Uh, you know, when things are made with purpose, they've got soul into them where the makers care, mm. and then it's got utility. To me, that's, that's a big part of luxury. That's how it should be. Mm. One last question, maybe? Man, you already had a question. Come on. <laughs> Anyone? Yes, Suresh. Um, you kind of <laughs> referred to this, but, but I see, you know, obviously there was a decline in, in the sort of sales of hats around the 1930s, 1940s, and then it's sort of slowly thing. They are now, when you think about hats, you think about people who wear them as being fashion forward, people who are a little bit more in the know about clothes and things like that. Mm. And there is certainly a bit of resurgence. Do you think the drive in this sort of sales of hats is more fashion related and therefore the sales and drop of hats? fashion related thing rather than a utility? Because traditionally people have always looked at hats more as utility rather than the sort of a fashion accessory. Um, so to that extent, do you think 
that's what's going to drive the sale of the pads? Exception that it's a passion item rather than a utilitarian item? Well, the first, uh, the first thing that just popped into my head as you were asking that is one of the things that um, really took all of the cool out of the hat was in like the 50s where hats started to be worn less and then it became almost a uniform in, in um, you know, especially like the early 60s where there was um, certain companies that would make you wear a hat. It was even though they didn't want to. And it was, um, it became, you know, just sort of a very, uh, you know, you th the image of like the, the old man's hat in the 60s, just, you know, and then people not wanting them and then they became cheaper and they, you know, they just, they didn't look very good in general. What was being made, you could just, and we've, right now it's, full circle from being forced to wear it or you have to wear it or everyone has one. Now it, it is something that's a lot more, uh, it's the opposite, right? You know, so, and I, I love that. So I, I don't really mind that nobody's, you know, it's not that every, I want, my dream is for everybody to have this on. It's, it's fun to be one of the few that understands and appreciates this, but it's also great when people get into it. And I don't mm. know if you've got any, um, yeah, no, I think, yeah, I think it's just that, that point earlier about um, individualism. I think anyone, it's much easier to dress in lots of different styles these days. And it also means I think people are wearing hats in lots of different ways as well. They can be very practical, but also can be a fashion thing. And you see guys wearing them in much more kind of fashionable ways as well. But I find that that's really interesting how, like socially and culturally, something, it can become universal and that point kind of really, really unfashionable. Yeah. Like a, the, there's the film The Man in the Grey Flannel Suit that, you know, the point of the title is that that's kind of the most boring thing that you could possibly wear, and, that, and that's the sign of uniformity. And yet today, that's like, for most guys into tailing, it's like, that's the perfect suit. That's the suit I want. That's the most amazing yeah. suit. So it kind of completely flips around, exactly. you know, depending on just how many people are wearing it, basically. Yeah. Another good example. I think every, everything that we're talking about can apply to a lot of the different well-made things in, mm. this, you know, the, uh, in menswear. Cool. Okay, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much to everyone for coming. Thank you very much to Dan for talking to us. Thank you. For more practical information and reviews of artisans, check out permanentstyle.com, the UK's leading website on craft and classic style.